Hello and welcome to Faith Up Today. I'm sure that the blessing of the Lord is upon you and upon all that bears even your name. I'm excited at what the Lord is doing in your life and what the Lord is planning even for your future. I know that your path is the path of the righteous. It shines more and more even unto the perfect day. Do not look at the challenges. Look at the glorious future that the Lord has spoken to you about because it's the Lord who is true and is not a God that is above all school. He always keep his word. And that's why we can always depend even upon him. Like I've always said, God can be counted upon. I want to say welcome to Fade Up. I'm sincerely very excited at what I want to share with us today. And I want us to do me a favor, all of us watching this. I want you to take a while, take a moment. If you are, this is your first time, even on this channel, please subscribe. Um, if you're on Mixler, on YouTube, wherever you're joining from, I'd like you to also share this link with your friends, with your colleagues, and say it's time even for service uh, and the Lord's blessing will remain and abound even over and upon you. As a people, the Lord has said to us that it's our year of divine, it's our month of divine upliftment. Uh, and so I want us to start by that, with that even this day. I want us to start by praying. The Bible says something that I love, uh, Psalm 75, and then you begin to read from verse 6. Uh, the Bible says promotion uh, does not come from the south. It doesn't come from the west. Uh, neither does it come from the east. Uh, scripture says, but God is lifted up of one uh, and he bring down another. So I know that the one that lifts uh, is Yahweh. I want to go to Yahweh, want to ascend uh, even before his throne room, even tonight. Uh, and I want you to begin to pray and ask that the lifting of the Lord will come upon you. Can you ask that the Lord will lift you up? Uh, wherever you are, however you are, whatever juncture of your life you are right now, there is still more in God. Uh, there can still be an upliftment uh, concerning that business. Uh, concerning the works of your ends, uh, concerning your spiritual life, there is always more because the horizon of heaven uh, is limitless. Can you ask that the Lord will lift you up? Can you ask that the Lord will increase you? Are you praying this day? Are you praying this day? Are you asking for lifting? Vi adoro pali kratosi akapali emando dovra kale kloda kadi ediada dobra kali ediada dosa ema kole kade volu braka zakatayaba Is someone saying, Lord, lift me up according to your word. Uh, lift me up according to your word. Uh, for somebody that might be a change of job, uh, for somebody that might be increased, uh, even your place of work, whatever it is, uh, I wanted to ask the Lord uh, that in this month of September, you will experience upliftment. Uh, it will not just be something you hear about. Uh, it won't be something you read about. Uh, but it will be a tangible reality in your life. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Someone saying, Lord, lift me up. Uh, lift me up. Up. It's a simple prayer, but I want you to pray. Lift me up, oh God. Lift me up, oh God. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shout of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Psalm 27, verse 6. Bible says, and now my head will be lifted up. And can you say, and now, and now. And now my head will be lifted up. Can you declare that? And now my head will be lifted up. And now my head will be lifted up in ministry. And now my head will be lifted up in my finances. And now, and now. Can you declare that with conviction? Can you declare that knowing that there is a God? He's the king of Israel. Is there is a God? He's the king of Zion. And he listens. He listens. Can you say now in the name? Name of Jesus, and now my air do be lifted up in tech, and now my air do be lifted up in my in my industry, and now my air do be lifted up in the name of Jesus. Declare that, declare that. Psalm three, verse three. The Bible says, "For you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. My glory, and the one who lifts my head." This was the confession. This was the conclusion the psalmist came to, I want you to come to that conclusion tonight. Uh, but you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory and the one who lifts my head. Can somebody declare, let the Lord hear it. Let the Lord hear it. You are my glory. You are my shield, uh, the lifter up of my head. Uh, lifting comes only from the north. Uh, the northernmost part of Zion is the one who lifts up one uh, and bring down another. Can you declare tonight uh, prophetically out of those who will count September as their month of lifting, your name will be a part of them.
them. Uh, this will be your song. Uh, this will be your testimony. I am lifted uh, at the juncture of giving up. Uh, I see the Lord turning things around for you. Declare it. It is my bond. Uh, it is my bond of lifting. Uh, Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name and amen. I want that verse of scripture, Psalm 3, verse 3. I want it to be your song throughout this September, throughout this month. Uh, I want you to say, But you, O Lord, are a shield round about me, my glory the lifter of my head. Uh, I want you to keep saying it when you wake up uh, in the noon time at night. I want you to declare it, uh, say it clearly, say it explicitly. You, O oh Lord, are a shield uh, round about me, my glory, the lifter up of my head. Uh, therefore, when other people are scheming, uh, you know that the Lord uh, is the lifter even of your head. Hallelujah. Amen. As it concerns of lifting, I want to give you a word. Luke chapter 1 verse 52. The Bible says, He has brought down rulers from their thrones and He has exalted those who were humble. There's a secret in scriptures and I want to put that secret in your hand today. Bible says He has brought down rulers from their thrones. So the one who brings down is Jehovah. But Bible says, and He has exalted those who who were humble. Therefore, the key to lifting is humility. The key to lifting is humility. I want to encourage you. I don't know how blessed you've become. I don't know the many blessings of the Lord upon your life. It might be apparent, it might be very clear. But one key that you will need in order to assess the next level as it concerns Jehovah is that you must have an humble heart. So you must possess an humble heart. Why? Because when the Lord finds a man who is humble, he finds a person and a vessel that he can lift up. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, we're beginning, we're starting again from where we dropped the baton even last Wednesday. I want to continue in this journey. Uh, this journey will, end, will last us through the month of September. And I'm excited at what the Lord has been doing. I'm excited at the praise report, at the things I've heard. And today, I particularly am excited because we are taking this to a new level. All right, I want to today explain uh, a phenomenon to us that we all... Uh, go through or we will pass through in our spiritual journey, in our journey into God, in our journey into Christ, uh, in our spiritual journey and our sojourn on this side of eternity, we all have certain experiences that I want to try and explain to you because if you can get this, uh, then you would always be able to get the wisdom that such experience brings, uh, right? Many times believers go through things uh, and they are really excited about the emotionalism, uh, the sensationalism of those things. Uh, not thinking about the wisdom that those experience brings, uh, the wisdom that they bring. And because if you walk in wisdom, uh, then you are walking in the way of the just. Uh, the Bible says that it may turn uh, men from the way of foolishness to the wisdom that is called the wisdom even of the just. I want to start today uh, by um, showing us certain scriptures. Let, let's go to the word of the Lord together today. Exodus 19, and then we'll read verses 10 to 11. And then we'll just take it there to the New Testament and see Luke chapter 24 as such a quite long reading, 13 to 32. Praise God. Exodus 19. I want to read verses 10 to 11. Exodus 19 and then verses 10 and then to 11. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Right? Um, the Bible says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. He said, For on and the Lord, this was the Lord saying this. He said, Go prepare your folks, go prepare your people. Because on the third day, I will come upon Mount Sinai. The Lord was making an appointment with his people through his prophet Moses. And he was saying, go tell them. Let them put their house in order. Let them consecrate themselves. Let them set themselves apart. Let them consecrate, set themselves apart unto holy things. Let them only do things that are devoted to holiness. Let them abstain from certain things. Why? Because I, the Lord, I am coming. I, the Lord, 
I am coming. Let's go quickly to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I want to see um, some verses of scriptures there. Exciting stuff. Luke 24. Right? And um, 24. And then we'll read verses 13 to 32. Uh, these, were, these were certain guys, um, disciples of the Christ. And um, this was after the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke 24. And then I'm, I'm going to read from then verse 13 and then to 32. Praise God. Now, behold, that word behold, it means see. Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was why they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but he didn't know. Verse 17 says, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all these today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of them, and certain of those who are with us, went to the tomb and found it just as the women are said. But him they did not see. Verse 25. All foolish ones and slow of art to believe in all that the prophet has spoken. Ought not the Christ that, to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Right? Let's just go to verse 32 then. Right? And he said, And they said to one another, because Jesus had vanished from their sight, and then they said to one another, Did our hearts, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, did not our hearts burn while he talked to us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures, he burned unto us. Today, I want to share with you what I titled When God Comes. When God Comes. Listen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Because the entrance of the word will give life, give understanding unto the simple. As simple folks, we've come to learn at your feet. And I make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, Lord. And I write the word of life upon the spirit of your people. After now, make us better people. Let us walk according to your counsel for our lives. Thank you because you are good. In Jesus' madness, a beautiful name we have prayed. Amen. Have you ever been in a service uh, where the presence of the Lord was so heavy that you probably, as the Spirit began to move, you began to cry. Or as the Spirit began to move, you could not stand anymore. You fell down. I probably started rolling on the floor. Or something hit you. Power hit you. And uh, it took you a while to come back to yourself. Or have you been in a service that you are just trembling and then you say, God is here. You see, don't you can sing the song that when the glory comes, there will be no word to say. Listen, when God comes, certain things happen. But the idea is simple, that when the Lord visited your church and when the Lord came to your church, that thing began to happen to you. You felt like you could not stand. You felt the hand of the Lord upon you. Probably you started crying. You remember the things that had happened to you. And certain realities happened to you even at that particular moment. All right? But the gist is that that is not the only time God is around, right? Um, as it happened at Sinai, there's this God is everywhere. This was not the first time God was at Sinai. This was not the first time God was speaking to Moses. But Jehovah said, I'm going to come. And when God comes that I speak about, I'm speaking about the times that the God comes and there is a manifestation of his presence, right? So God is everywhere. But God's power, God's glory, and God's presence is not manifest in every place. 
so that yes god sees all things uh, and god is omniscience uh, he knows all things uh, god is also omnipresent that means god is everywhere but though he is everywhere his presence is not seen in a club uh, as it is felt in a church and god's presence is not felt every sunday the way it is felt on certain sunday so that God's presence uh, can be felt in different, a different measure and in different ways, right? So what am I saying? Uh, I'm saying that there are times that the Lord comes. Uh, now, the coming of the Lord signifies three things. I want to be very quick here and I want to make it very sharp so you understand what I'm saying. You see, the coming of the Lord signifies three things. Number one, it involves an apparent making known. Uh, when the Lord manifests and makes himself known that I'm here. You know, we can say that where two or three are gathered in his name, I'm there in the midst of them. And so we can begin from the pages of scriptures uh, to begin to say certain realities, which it is true. It is no less true because it is not felt uh, like when it is felt. So, yes, God's presence is there. But at certain times, God wants to show himself to us uh, beyond the pages of the scriptures. Uh, he wants our experience with him uh, to become a working reality. So God decides at certain times to make himself known uh, to our senses, make himself known to us uh, in epiphanies, uh, make himself known to us uh, in ways uh, that you and I can grasp. Uh, so when God does that, uh, right, so that it's not just the pastor saying God is here, you know that he's there. It's making himself known. Uh, you know, you can pray, do your daily devotion. Uh, and then at certain times, you know that I've touched God. God is here, right? Uh, and then what, are those, what does it signify? It signifies manifestation. So that apart from him being known, uh, you also begin to see certain demonstrations of the Spirit. Uh, you begin to see certain things that are unusual. It is like the supernatural touches the natural and both fades away. So it is only God that is known and seen at that particular juncture. What does he mean when we say God comes? It means that he shows himself forth. God reveals himself. God reveals himself. I want to help you seek meaning to such visions, manifestations, demonstrations, uh, revelations, and encounters, uh, even with Yahweh. I want to help you understand that these things happen not for sensationalism, not so you can boast, but there are relevant impact of these manifestations in the spiritual. And I want to give unto you codes and things that will help you work in the realities of what those experiences uh, actually bring. So, right why does he do that to us he does this in order to give man a revelation of him the major reason god shows forth the major reason there is manifestation the major reason there is a showing forth is so that man may know him he wants to reveal himself to you god is in the heavens but beyond god wanting to be in the heaven god likes to close the distance between himself and us he doesn't want to be a god that is far he wants to be a God that is near. God's intention and God's mind is that you and I are close to him. There is a revelation of God that is battered because he himself makes himself known. These kind of things are, yes, can be because we lay the wood, but they happen because of the mercies of God. Yeah, we can lay the wood at the altar. We can prepare for the king, but the king must choose to come even amongst us. Our Christian race, should be characterized by revelations of God. Our Christian experience should be characterized with revelations of God. As we journey in getting close to God, I feel that it is important uh, to understand that the heartbeat of God is to reveal himself to you. God does not want to be that mysterious one. He wants to be that one who is there, close to you. He wants you to know him just like he knows you. He wants to be known. He wants to reveal himself, not only to you, to your family, but to your generation. The coming of God should be a living and working reality for believers. The coming of God. I'm speaking of when God comes. The coming of God should be a living and working reality for believers. It should not be something we hear from the mouth of generals or, or, or what, what we experience from, from, from our pastors alone. It should be something we can be able to say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Because God wants to show himself to you. I want you to put that at the back of your mind. God wants to show himself to me. Make it personal. 
He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to be known. He wants you to know and discover him more. He wants you to grow even in the knowledge of him. He doesn't want to just exist in the pages of the Bible. He wants to be a God that is real. He, wants to, he doesn't want to exist in your, in your history, in your family history, so that you can say, I know my father served me, my father went to church. He wants to be a God of today. As your father knew him, he also wants to be known even by you. The God of all flesh wants you to know him. Therefore, at certain times in our journey, he would choose to show himself to us. He would reveal himself to us like he did to Israel. And this is the story we began from. Israel were on the journey to the promised land. And the Bible says on Mount Sinai, the Lord had said to Moses, go to your people. I don't just want you to give them the law. I don't just want you to give them the commandments. I like to show forth myself so that they can know that this God is real. And this God is not just the figment of the imagination of certain people. So it, beyond just knowing and feeling the power of God and saying, yeah, God was good, it was glorious. He destroyed uh, um, the girls and he, he fought the girls uh, and he won over the girls of, of Egypt. He wants to also be that God who can come into the affairs of our lives uh, and who we know that is our personal God. That's the idea behind God showing forth himself to Israel. And the Bible says uh, that he came uh, to Israel, Exodus 19, verse 10 to 11, and he's asked them uh, for an appointment. And the Lord kept the appointment. Uh, you understand again that Abraham saw an encounter God in Theophanes. Uh, Paul of Saul uh, of Tarsus, uh, on his way to Damascus, uh, met with Jesus. Uh, that encounter changed everything about his life. Ananias uh, also had a vision of the Christ. Two disciples uh, were on their way to Emmaus from the place of pain, from the place of sorrow, from the place of disappointment. Uh, they were just on that journey and they began to reminisce. They began to think about the things which had happened. It was for them that the Messiah had been taken away. He was lost hope. They were in despair. And as they began a journey, the Bible says Jesus joined them on the journey. When God comes, God came to them at the point of despair, at the point of pain, of discouragement. And he shared that conversation with them. And then we understood that in that human God conversation, there something happened to them. Even though they were talking to God, they did not know. Scripture says that after he had broken the bread, uh, Scripture says after he had disappeared, they said, was it not true that something born in our hearts, uh, even as he spoke, uh, even to us, as he opened the Scriptures to us, uh, something born in them. So, uh, allow me to say that when the Lord comes, uh, there are certain tangible realities that happen. Certain tangible realities uh, in our experiences, certain tangible realities uh, that can be said uh, to be common with every time the Lord comes. It's like when a visitor comes and visits your house, uh, some of them leave their perfume behind, uh, they leave their smell behind, uh, they leave their scent uh, even behind. Uh, you can tell, even if you come to that house, uh, hours after they have left, you can tell that they came. Why? Because they left their scent uh, even behind. Listen dear friends, there are seasons and times that we will encounter God and even after that encounter there would be the lasting sense even of the presence of God in our life. There will be that lasting sense that we have met with the Lord and our life even has changed. There will be that lasting sense that something about us have changed. Many times when these things happen, we talk about the experience and the encounter and the story behind the encounter without looking at the benefit, the principles of those encounters. Allow me to say to you that you can have a vision of the Lord, but the message of the vision is more important than the vision of the Lord. You can have a dream of the Lord. Let me say to you that the message of the dream is more important than the dream itself. Right? You can have the, you can hear a voice and then you can begin to describe the voice, the light, just like Saul of Tarsus did on the way to Damascus. But it was more important that he takes as a priority the message that the Christ gave at that encounter much more 
than the story of I meeting with God. Allow me to share with you five things that are paramount, five things that, that are ubiquitous with every encounter, every time the Lord comes. There are five unique things that you must know that will help you tell this is God, this is not the devil, this is God. And these are the things you should note every time the Lord comes, right? And this will also tell you um, why certain believers are more genuine. Why certain believers live such a life that pleases God more than certain believers, right? Let me begin to tell you things that happen when God comes. Number one, there is a revelation of His holiness. Revelation of His holiness. Something happened at Sinai. God said, I'm coming, but I'm giving you three days. Three days to put yourself in order. Three days to set things in order. Three days to, to prepare even to receive his holiness. Why? Because he is majestic in power. He is a holy God. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 to 16, the Bible says this God is holy. It's an absolute nature of God, holiness. As the Bible says, be ye holy as he is holy. Listen, dear friends, God's holiness is not scary. God's holiness is not terrible. It is the beauty and splendor that make him a God of his own class. It is the beauty and the splendor that makes him the God of his own class. We are a generation that want to scare off God. Want to be afraid of God because he's holy. Because he's holy. But that holiness of God is such a splendor. It's such a beautiful thing. How, how will he be God if he was not holy? How will he be God if he's a God that is biased? How will he be God if he's a God that performs and observes iniquity himself? How will he be God if he's a God that does not keep even his own word? How will he be God if he is not holy? Holiness is therefore a basic essence even of God. Is that essence even of God. It's not something we should be afraid of. It's not something we should scare off. We become a generation, New Testament believers, uh, who do not want the messages on holiness. Uh, we don't want to talk about holiness uh, because we think when we talk about that, we are speaking concerning works. Uh, no, that is an error. Holiness is not about works. Uh, holiness is about God because He is the holy God. He is the essential attribute of His person. If you take away His part of holiness, then we can't trust Him anymore. We can't trust His judgment. Uh, we can't trust trust his mercy. We can't trust uh, his righteousness. Uh, we can't trust him for favor. We can't trust him for kindness. Uh, it is the foundation even of his throne that he is a God of holiness. Uh, therefore, it is a splendor. It's a majestic thing. It's something we should worship. Little one that loved that song, uh, oh, that talks about his holiness. Uh, we must worship him uh, even in the beauty, even the beauty of his holiness. Uh, God was telling Israel, don't come near the mountain. Don't, don't come near the mountain. I am holy. I am holy. Listen, let me show you something in scriptures. Isaiah chapter 6. What an encounter that man had with the Lord. You see, when you have had an encounter with God, it changes everything about you. When somebody has seen the Lord, it changes something about them. It's not God you encounter. If after that encounter, you become uh, more of a sinner. You become sin permissive. You, you teach doctrines uh, that are permissive of sin. You have not encountered the true God. You have not seen him uh, in the beauty even of his holiness. I tell people one landmark, one major landmark uh, of testing uh, a theology, of testing whether a man of God is true or not, uh, is to see the fruits uh, even of his sermon. Is to see the fruits uh, even of his sermon. If the truth uh, does not describe this essential of God, which is holiness. You might not teach it, you might not preach it, you don't have to call the name of your ministry, is holiness ministry, but after we see the people who have become your disciples after many years, and we see the kind of life they live, then we know you have met, even with God. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, listen to this. Bible says in verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, I and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had his wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, listen to what they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
And the Bible says, and the doors of the door, and the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Listen, it was not the voice of God that made the door to shake. The Bible says it was the voice of thee who cries and say, Only, only, only is the Lord of hosts. This was not even God at all speaking. Another person spoke. Uh, that's to tell you the power of this God. And the Bible says, So I said, when you see such dimensions of power, when you see such majesty, when you see God in the beauty of his holiness, when perhaps you have a revelation of the holiness of God, one thing would you will say, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Listen, New Testament believer may not use the word, Woe is me, for I am undone. Oh, but they will say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. I can't stand on this ground without him. They would bow and worship, seeing his holiness. They would say, I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy to be here. It's only by Jesus I can come to the throne room. You can't have seen and have a revelation of Jehovah and be pompous and be proud. The holiness of God humbles us. It humbles us. If you have really have a revelation, even of his holiness, Humility will be the result. Humility will be the result. Number two, there is a revelation of his power. In Exodus 19, now I, I said to us that God actually gave an appointment to Israel. It's, it's through Moses. Exodus 19, 10, 11. He said, in three days, he said, I would come to you. In three days, I will come to you. Now, let's see what happens when the Lord came. And it's okay to make preparation because God is coming. It's okay if your guest, if you have a guest that you really value, and the person says, I'm going to be in your house at a particular time, uh, you are going to make all efforts to ensure that their stay is okay, that their stay is good. I remember how impromptu we finished service one day, and Father and Lord said, I'm going to your house. And my wife was not in church because we just delivered a baby and all of that. And I had to call her and say, He's coming home. He said, Hey, and I'm sure what was going on in her mind. It's not that the house was not put in place, but you want everything to be perfect. Why? Because you honor that person. Listen, this is exactly this. So, so this is not about just using, you know, people who say, you know, this is teaching Old Testament. It's not, no, 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 no. This is the way of man. This is how it is. When God comes, there is preparation. And he told them, he said, prepare, I'm coming. Now, when he came, look at what happened. When the Lord came to Sinai, Look at what happened. Before his presence, there was something that happened, just like the man Isaiah saw. And the man spoke, holy, holy. And the Bible said there was shakings. Look at what happened here. Verse 16, the Bible said, then it came to pass on the third day. You know, he told them on the third day it was going to come. In the morning, that there were thunderings and lightning. And a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. Can you see that? To meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The Lord descended. You see, Yahweh is a great God. Yahweh is a great God. Bible says his smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the old mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in a voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai. On the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The second thing that happened is that there is a revelation even of his power. There is a revelation of his power. If you encounter God, you will leave that place of encounter with the revelation that God is powerful. When you are in such a meeting, where the presence of the Lord is so heavy, where God chooses to manifest himself in a church service, when you leave that service, you live with the revelation of God's power. Many times we cease to understand why those things happen. We are more interested in, oh, oh, see the way people are falling down. Oh, 
See that woman laughing. Oh, see that person crying. You should leave that place with the revelation of his power. How powerful the Lord is. As it happened in Sinai, the Lord shakes churches. As it happened in Sinai, the Lord still shakes homes. As it happens in as it happens in Sinai, the Lord still shakes congregations, meetings, shaking with the power of God. Only pandemonium everywhere. We live with the place. We live such places with the revelation even of his power. God is powerful and nothing reveals his power like his manifestation. It's a different thing to read it in the pages of the scripture. That I am the Lord. I am powerful. Once I've spoken to us about her, the power belongs to God. I'm the Lord. Is there anything too hard for me to do? There's a different thing to feel it. There's a different thing to see it. To see miracles. Break out. To see healings. Ha. To hear testimonies of cancer disappear. It's a different thing. To be in meetings where God's power is real. Hey! You leave such meetings with a manifestation and a revelation. A revelation of God's power. Of God's power. Of God's power. You live with a revelation that God is powerful. God is powerful. I remember and I recall one of those meetings that I've had. And I left the meeting place. And a lot of people were still there. I remember somebody was not part. He was not even around. He chatted me up. He said, I was told that that was too powerful. I said, there is nothing too powerful with God. God just decided to come. Because when the Lord comes, revival happens. When the Lord comes, renewal happens. When the Lord comes, refreshing happens. When the Lord comes, there is a manifestation even of his power. Number three, there's a revelation again of his will. The divine will is certain times not known until there is a revelation of God. You may be walking and running in the wrong way without the revelation even of his will. That reminds me of that man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He was persecuting the church. He was against them. Even the kingdom, the kingdom of the Christ. <laughs> Until that day that he encountered even the Lord. I want to show you from the pages of scriptures again. How the Lord shows himself uh, even to us. And let's go to Acts chapter 9. And then verse 1 to 6. Verses 1 to 6. Acts chapter 9. I want to prove to you beyond doubt from scriptures. That listen, when God comes, uh, you know the will of the Father. That's one of the things that should happen when you have a vision of God, when, when the Lord visits you, when, when you are in a meeting, you should be asking God, give me a revelation of your holiness. Sir. Let me see what, what reveals God's power in this place. That's what you are looking for. That's what a mature believer is looking for. What, is there a revelation of his holiness? Because every pandemonium does not mean God is there. There can be pandemonium by demonic forces. There are people who have consulted demons uh, to receive power from evil forces. Uh. Therefore, you can see moves of God. But how I, and how can we tell that this is not of God? Because there is no revelation of his holiness. There's no revelation of his holiness. Our God is holy. There is a dent. You just sense uh, an, an odor that is bad that does not represent even Yahweh. Bible says, and I love this. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Then Saul, still breathing, threat and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked, Let us from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who are of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he joined, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and had a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gods. So he, trembling and stunned, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? A, manif a revelation of the will of God. The manifestation battered a knowing even of the will of God. And the Lord said to him, go. And you shall be told what you will do. And, and, and he didn't stop there. Let, let's look at that conversation, that revelation, and I asked her. 
Bible says in Acts chapter 9, you begin to read from verse 10, that you see the conversation of Ananias with the Lord. Now, there were certain disciples at Damascus named Ananias. Now, note, he was a disciple. He wasn't an apostle. He was a disciple. The Bible says, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. He started praying. <laughs> and in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So even this man had visions of God. Already, Saul of Tarsus had begun to have conversation with the Lord. You see that? The revelation of the will of God. He had seen in a vision that Ananias was going to come. Permit me to say, as Ananias would enter that room, Ananias can begin to talk and say, you know what? He's just looking and saying, pray, put your hands. Put your hands, because he had already seen a vision. Look at this. And I said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he, he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That was such a revelation of what will transpire and what will happen even via the ministry even of Saul. Listen, dear friends, every encounter when God comes, there is a revelation even of his will. Another thing is that there is a revelation even of his word. And that's what happened to the disciples on their journey to Emmaus. And they, as they journeyed to Emmaus, these folks found the law. They, they, Cleopas and his friend, uh, as they began to speak to one another and they encountered Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the Bible says uh, that they themselves said, did the word not born in us? As he shared the scripture to us, uh, it was our eyes not open to the scriptures. That's what happened. When, you, uh, when the Lord comes, there is a revelation of him. Uh, in his word, the Bible is known. You know, before you could have been reading scriptures, uh, belaboredly, you are just reading uh, with stress and all of that. But because now there is a revelation of the word, you know the word better. And then finally, number five, there is a revelation of his person. Hallelujah. And I love this. A revelation of his person. And that's, 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 that, that's a verb in every of the encounter or when God showed forth uh, or people had vision in scriptures. That's very clear. It's very clear. They saw the new dimension of God. They, they saw the person of God in vivid manifestation. From Moses to Abraham. From David to Solomon, vivid manifestations of God. They experienced God, Jehoshaphat experienced God in diverse ways because he manifested himself as the great and mighty one. To Abraham as the provider, to Moses as the Lord. He will always show himself to us so that we can have a tangible name to call him. And it will not just be a name we found in scriptures, it will be a name that is revealed to us. Why? Because every encounter should leave you with a new knowledge of the Lord. Every time the Lord comes, he comes to reveal his person to us. A new revelation of God. Why? Because the revelation of God is progressive. Our work with him must get better. And one of the ways in which he ensures that our work with him get better is via revelation by the means of his coming. So that what you know of him yesterday shouldn't be what you know of him yesterday. And it is fine, can I say to somebody today, that it is fine for you to change your belief and change your doctrine. Because as much as your revelation changes, it will impact your practical Christian living and teaching. If what I used to know of the Lord has changed because now he has revealed himself to me in a different way, then I can teach that. Sir, because And that may look to certain people that that is against what I used to preach. But it is not. It's just that I have a new revelation even of his person. Every time God comes, you will know him better. And God can come anytime. God can come 
even now. I'm not saying is God not everywhere. God was in Sinai before God manifested himself in Sinai. God is in your church even when your pastors are having meetings. God is there. But his presence is manifested in di- at different, different levels and in different measure. There is something we call the manifestation of his presence. And God can come even now. In your devotional time. At church. In your home. In your house. Right now. But there will be these peculiar experiences. There will be these things that will tell. They are marks of a God encounter. They are marks of a revelation of God. They are marks that God has come. When God comes, there is the manifestation of his holiness. So that we don't begin to change like shifting shadows. We do not follow every wind of doctrine. Why? Because our eyes is fixed on God. Our heart is fixated on Him. Every encounter must you view with a revelation of His word. A revelation of His person. A revelation of His holiness. Of His holiness. Of His holiness. And permit me to add a revelation of His grace. Who am I that you are mindful of me? Who am I that you love me? Who am I that I'm the chosen and beloved and favored? Who am I? Look at all I've got. Look at all I've had. Look at where you brought me from to where I am today. I can't explain it. Thank you. Thank you. It gives you a revelation of his grace. And one thing true grace does is that it leads to thanksgiving. When you've encountered grace... You are thankful. When you have found the grace of God, you are thankful. When you are found Him, you are grateful. In Him, there is no boasting at all. When we boast, we boast in the Lord. We have nothing. So that these revelations, these encounters, these things about Jehovah that we have experienced, that we have held, that our eyes have seen, our hands have undue, we do not boast about them because it was not just about us. It was in. It wasn't that we set the altar. It was that he chose to come. It wasn't that we fasted. It was that he showed forth and he showed up. It wasn't that we prayed, fasted, and expecting to come because we believe and had faith. It was because he kept his word. He came true for us. He came true for us. He kept his word. He's true, he's holy. There is none like him. Such grace, such good God. We will not count our sins against us. But we will love us and see us only via the lens of Christ and the finished works of Calvary. What joy. What joy. What awesomeness to be able to be called the child of God. You see, when you have truly encountered this person, he leaves you with the humility. You just know thank you. Thank you. Because the same, some people did the same thing you did and they didn't find it. Some people read scriptures. They didn't get any revelation of his word. Some people prayed and fasted. They didn't hear anything from the Lord. Had no revelation of his person. No revelation of his holiness. Some people are called. They're just the same way you are called. But they have messed up their ministry because there's no revelation of his holiness. But you have it. Praise God. Praise God. Will you one minute lift up your hands and say thank you. It's okay to sing a song. Yes, lift up that song that is coming from your heart. In thanksgiving, just worship Him. In the beauty of His holiness, just worship Him. In the awesomeness of His grace, worship Him. Adore Him. Enthrone Him. Is God God alone, King, King alone, Adonai, none like Him, none beside Him, worship Him, worship Him, worship Him, is God, Father we thank You, we give You glory, we give You praise, in Jesus name, and Amen, and Amen, when God comes, 
I want you to just have an open heart and open mind and get ready for the visitation of heaven because it will come. Like I said, it doesn't come only in church meetings and in crusade grounds. It can come right now. Tonight, you can have an encounter, have a vision of God, have a revelation of God. But look for those five things. And as you write things that drive down that experience, ensure you write out how these things showed you the vision of God, the person of God, the will of God, the mind of God, and how this was a revelation even of His grace. I know that the Lord will do great things in your life, and your life will never even be the same. Be the same again. Amen.